This video will take a look at wide area networks, also known as WANs. Now in the previous video we looked at local area networks and we learned that they were uh, covering a small geographical area and that the owner of the network will own all of the devices, all the cabling um, on that network. Now with a wide area network, wide area networks cover large geographical areas and often um, much of the uh, infrastructure of a wide area network are actually owned by third party companies like telecommunication companies uh, that might provide phone lines and satellites. Now the biggest wide area network on the planet is of course the internet and it's important to recognize what the internet is. Uh, it's a network of networks, it's a gigantic gigantic collection of computers all connected together and don't get confused with the World Wide Web because the World Wide Web is just one of the services that the internet can provide. The internet is, um, as I said, a network of networks. The World Wide Web is just one application of the internet. Another application might be the email system. A host is any computer on a network which offers to serve users from another location using the internet. And web hosting um, is a service provided by lots of companies and these companies host websites on their servers so that everybody on the internet if they chose to could visit those websites. And they'll often uh, charge a small fee so that you can uh, rent out their hard drive space, a bit of their, um, their server and they might also add in some security and backup services as well. And if you wish to, you could actually create your own little web um, server uh, with a, a computer at home. You just need to install some software, have it connected to your, um, your home hub, and you could host a website. Now, we'll have a look at DNS. Now, DNS is uh, part of the GCSE um, specification, um, and it's important. It's a very important area that seems to come up in exams quite a lot. So over the next few slides, we're going to have a look to see what happens when you try and actually access a website on the internet. Um, but there's lots of key terminology, lots of acronyms that we need to understand first of all. So we'll have a look at IP addresses, ISP, URL, and then of course we'll have a look at what DNS is. So an IP address is an internet protocol address, and it's literally just a... a a unique number that is given to every computer as it comes onto the internet. No two computers can have the same address and it's simply the same idea as having um, our postal addresses at home. Every house in the country will have its own address just so that uh, posts can be delivered to those houses. So when we're trying to um, send data from one computer to the other, we will need an IP address so that we know exactly where to send that data. So no um, two computers will have the same address. However, a device's IP address might not remain the same each time it joins a network. ISP, so this is, your, this is an internet service provider. This is the company that provides you with your internet connection. So you might have um, your connection provided by BT or by Sky or by Virgin. These are all examples of ISPs. Now a URL is just a fancy name for a web address. Okay, It stands for Uniform Resource Locator, but you will have seen URLs all the time when you've been online. So bbc.co.uk or www.google.com. These are all examples of URLs. So let's get to DNS. DNS means Domain Name System. And it's the system that is used to find the computer which hosts the website that you're looking for. Now, computers can only connect to other computers if they know their IP addresses. But humans aren't very good at remembering um, lots of random numbers. When I say random, they're not random, but uh, a bundle of numbers. We're not very good at remembering it, but we are really good at remembering the names of companies, and as a result, we're quite good at remembering um, URLs. So you can't remember the IP address of the computer which hosts, let's say, the BBC website, so you type in to your browser www.bbc.co.uk. At that point, your computer cannot connect to the BBC website because it doesn't know its IP address. So what it does um, is your computer will send that uh, URL to your ISP. 
your internet service provider and they will look up your URL, that URL that you've requested on their DNS which is like an address book. They'll find the URL, URL in their database so they'll look and they'll find bbc.co.uk and then what they'll do is they will um, next to that address they will have an IP address for that particular web server. That, you are, uh, that IP address will then be sent back to your computer so that it can then communicate directly with the computer which hosts that website. So you can then visit the website and that's how DNS works. So we've just seen how some computers on the internet can host websites. There are other services uh, that computers on the internet can provide. Um, so we'll have a look at cloud computing. So the cloud is a network of servers uh, on the internet which offer lots of different services, maybe to store, maybe to process data. Uh, so it often relates to online services provided by companies such as Google, such as Microsoft, um, Net Netflix and Spotify. So these are all examples of cloud computing. So Office 365 and Google Docs will provide you with applications such as uh, word processing or spreadsheets. Cloud storage um, will offer you services so that they can um, store your data and you can access it from anywhere as long as you've got an internet connection and Netflix and Spotify are streaming services so they will provide you with uh, the ability to stream films and stream music these are all examples of cloud computing now why would a company use some a service like um, Office 365 why wouldn't they just buy uh, Microsoft Office and have it installed um, on their servers at the organization's premises well, there are a lot of uh, advantages that cloud computing can offer. They first of all don't need to actually buy and install software. So the startup costs are, are not there. Uh, any connected computer can access the service. So you could actually get your uh, workers working from home or in the office or on their phones or on their tablets. As long as they've got the internet connection, they can um, get those services. Uh, there's no need to upgrade software so the companies will automatically improve the service online uh, without you having to then purchase the next version. You can collaborate with other people so um, often these services will allow two, three, four people all to use the same document at the same time. Work is automatically saved and backed up so there's no worry about data being lost. Um, and generally all of this leads to lower costs which so it's you know very very positive. There are, however, a couple of um, negatives that need to be considered. Um, it's really important that you uh, realize as a company where your data is being stored because you might have very sensitive data that's on um, certain documents that have been produced, certain spreadsheets, and if they're stored in another country which doesn't adhere to the same laws as your own country, then uh, the company could be in some serious trouble. And it's also completely reliant on the internet. So as soon as your network connection, your internet connection goes down, then um, you won't be able to use those services. Now virtual networks, uh, we'll take a look at now. Um, we've already seen that local area networks cover a small geographical area and wide area networks cover a wide geographical area. Um, and both types, they're created through um, physical connections, um, connections of, of hardware. Now a virtual network is one that uses software to split up a physical network. It could be a local area network, it could be a wide area network, but it splits it up into smaller ones and it's software that does this subdivision. Now if you were to use um, software to break up and, and split up um, and subdivide a local area network that's known as a, a VLAN, okay, a virtual LAN. So for small virtual networks, uh, simple virtual network networks, software will redivide a local area network into smaller networks so that maybe smaller uh, groups of workers can communicate separately from other people in the company. And because it's software which enables uh, the network to um, be subdivided, it's known as a virtual network. Now in terms of wide area networks, they too can be subdivided into smaller virtual networks through software. And why might we want to do that? Well, we might have um, groups of workers um, of a company spread out across the whole of the country or perhaps across the world. And we might want them to communicate and share information separately from other members of the company. 
And because it's the internet that we are subdividing, uh, we'll need to have added security and that's done through encryption. And due to this, um, that's the reason why we're calling them private networks. Um, yes, they're, they're uh, subdivided using software, but they're known as virtual private networks because of that added encryption, because we're using the internet. 